All right, Alexander, let's uh, do an update as to what's going on with the gas situation in Europe. And um, there's there's a couple of things, and, and I guess some of it could be one, one thing could be contradicting the other. I don't know, maybe not. Um, the first announcement that I saw this morning was that they've kind of agreed, the EU has kind of agreed to a, to an oil price cap. So I don't know if we want to talk about that. We're talking about gas, but I don't know if we want to talk about the oil price uh, cap as well. Uh, 65 to 70 a barrel is what they're trying to agree on. It looks like they've agreed on it. The only holdout is Poland. They want 30 a barrel. Anyway, that's one thing with oil. Now let's talk about gas. I actually read a report yesterday stating that the EU is fully divested from Russian gas. They've accomplished their goals for this year. For this year, they've accomplished their goals. They have enough gas in storage. They uh, they have enough LNG that they've uh, secured, and they're going to be able to eke out this winter. They don't talk about next winter. They don't talk about the price of the LNG. They don't talk about any of that stuff, but they say that as of this year, or at least this year, the EU has done it. Mission accomplished. They're fully divested from uh, Russian uh, energy, Russian gas. Then we have the other story, which is, uh, which is saying that the EU is going to have big time gas problems in 2023. Now, I guess that does make sense. To a certain extent, if you consider that for the first half of 2022, the EU was knowingly stocking up on gas in their uh, storage facilities because they were about to, to cut off um, Russia from, uh, from supplying them gas. So for, I say, about the first four or five months they were stocking up as, on as much gas as they possibly could get into their storage facilities. And then they decided to cut Russia off. So um, that I think that's pretty much the picture, a, uh, a, big, a big picture as to what's going on in the EU, not only with gas, actually, but with oil as well. So uh, where, where do you want to be, begin? You want to tackle the oil well, price cap I first? Think I think I will. That's kind of breaking I, I, news, and then we'll move on to gas. I will. T- I will let, let us indeed talk about oil because, of course, oil and gas are connected things. I mean, it's all part of the um, overall crisis in the European energy system. Now, bear in mind that this oil price cap idea was proposed by Janet Yellen, who is the Treasury Secretary of the United States. The United States is essentially self-sufficient in oil. I mean, it's less self-sufficient than it was a few years ago when Donald Trump was president. And probably that period of self-sufficiency, to the extent that it exists, is eroding away because of the Biden administration's policies. But we're not going to talk about that in this program. For the moment, the United States can get by. It can. It doesn't have to import oil in huge quantities. The European Union, by contrast, imports most, nearly all of its oil. I mean, there are oil producers. Britain is an oil producer, but of course it's not part of the EU. Norway is an oil producer. It's not part of the EU. Some of their oil goes to the EU, however. Um, And the other EU states, to all intents and purposes, well, the other EU states, the EU states, to, to all intents and purposes, are not oil producers. So they have to buy their oil on the international market. So Janet Yellen's idea is going to have a less of an impact in the United States. It's going to have a major impact in Europe because, of course, the Russians are saying that they're not prepared to sell oil to anybody who is not prepared to buy their oil for market prices. And the United States does buy some Russian oil, as by the way does Britain, it's buying it through middlemen. The EU um, is saying that in a few weeks' time it's going to stop basically importing oil, though it too, by the way, is leaving it open to talk Russian oil, though it too is perhaps going to do it through middlemen eventually. So they're now arguing about this price cap, which is an idea foisted on them by Janet Yellen. And they're talking about 65 to 70 dollars a barrel now this 
figure that they're coming up with, 65 to $70 a barrel, is roughly the amount the Russians are selling their oil at the present time to India for. But there is a fundamental difference, and that is that, of course, what the Russians and the Indians agree with each other is a commercial agreement. What the EU is trying to do is impose an artificial price cap. Now, the Russians will not cooperate with it. The Indians, as far as I can see, have no incentive to, because from their point of view, why would they agree to a price gap which leaves the amount of the price of oil that they're buying from the Russians about the same, but allows the EU to dictate the future price? The same goes for China, the same goes for Turkey, the same goes for every single country basically outside the G7. So this is a completely unworkable idea. It's run into massive problems. The Poles, of course, are coming up with ridiculous proposals of $30 a barrel, which nobody takes seriously, apart from perhaps some people in Poland. And virtually everybody understands that this all price cap notion is going to fail and isn't going to work. Stephen Mnuchin, who was... Uh, Janet Yellen's predecessor as Treasury Secretary in the Trump administration says this is the most stupid idea he's ever come across. It's an absurd idea. There was an article in Zero Hedge which published a tweet about a joke that oil traders are making about each other, which is that we won't buy beer. We'll try and set the price of beer in our local bar at a, you know, the price that we want, except, of course, we're not going to buy our beer from that bar, and when can't impose that price on any of the bar's other customers. I mean, it, it is an absolutely cockeyed idea. But the Europeans are spending their time talking with each other about something that can't work, that won't, um, that won't achieve the result that they want, they're trying to find ways of watering it down by raising the price, as I said, to $70, which is essentially the price the Russians are, um, are, are selling their oil for at the moment. They're trying to find ways of allowing India to resell oil to them. They don't want to make too many disruptions to the oil price. They're trying to do all of these things, and they're not looking at their underlying massive problems, because their biggest energy problem, yes, oil is going to be a major problem, because they've essentially cut themselves off from direct buying of Russian oil. They will be buying Russian oil in future through middlemen, but at a premium, instead of directly from the Russians, at a likely discount. But their major problem is going to be gas. And... Their problem here is exactly what you said. They filled up their underground gas reserves at the start of this year by buying gas from the Russians at absolute record levels. That began to run down from the second half of 2022. Um, the winter is now becoming significantly colder. They're starting to draw gas from those reserves. LNG is proving to be extremely expensive, exactly as everybody said. Competition for LNG is intensifying, including, by the way, from the United States. And the EU's own industry commissioner has said that Europe is going to face a very severe energy crunch in the winter of 2023-2024, irrespective of what happens this year, unless the war in Ukraine ends before then. <laughs> so, that's the problem. But they're not talking about what to do with that problem. They're spending all their time debating with each other
the oil price cap with the Russians, which is an unworkable idea that they've already, in effect, watered down. Yeah, the oil price cap is is just idiotic. Yeah. It really is. It, and it doesn't make any sense. I mean, no. anyway, anyway uh, $30 is what Poland wants it for. Why not $1? I mean... Yeah, no. indeed, why thirty? Why, why, Make why, it one dollar. I mean, one dollar. Absolutely. <laughs> <You know? laughs> anyway, uh, let's focus on the gas part of, of things. Yeah. Um, mm. Is it true that because the the EU is going to be um, purchasing its uh, gas via LNG spot markets via LNG, so they're going to have to, from what I understand, when you're purchasing LNG, it's mostly on uh, on the spot markets. Does that mean that it's going to raise the price of gas worldwide? Because yes. once again, you're introducing another big buyer, a big competitor yes. into into the bids for these uh, for this LNG. So I, I guess not only are EU citizens going to suffer at the increase in, in in gas prices and the shortages and the shortages and the increase, but worldwide we're going to have uh, difficulties. Absolutely, because of course there's now going to be much sharper competition for LNG. And um, I should say that with the EU, they've been insisting for some years now that all gas brine, including gas supplied by pipelines, should be provided, should be bought by EU uh, companies at spot prices. But LNG, of course, is much more vulnerable to those kind of fluctuations if you're going to depend on the spot market than pipeline gases. Putin talks about this all the time. He said they were idiotic to move towards spot prices for their pipeline gas. They're idiotic to do it for their LNG. But they've done it. It's an ideological dogma, and they're going to stick with it. And anyway, it is more suitable for LNG. Now... Realistically, always, there's going to be a shortage of LNG if you're going to depend on, L- on, liquefi- on, on LNG. The technology to move ships and tankers and build up storage facilities with LNG is enormously complicated. And it is profoundly different, by the way, from storing pipeline gas. It's, th- th- there's no real similarity between the two. You can't take LNG, convert it into gas, and simply put it into an underground gas reserve in the way that um, you know, the present gas reserves are structured because the technologies are completely different. I mean, you could eventually find a way, but it would be a very expensive thing to do. So there's going to be a shortage of LNG over the next five, ten years. Prices are going to skyrocket. They're going to skyrocket globally. It's going to set the Europeans in competition with the Asians. The Asians arguably have the deeper pockets. Um, The US, again, is, relatively speaking, self-sufficient in terms of gas. Um, Again, thanks to the shale revolutions. Already prices of of, gas, uh, energy are about four to five times lower, apparently, in the US than they are in Europe. Uh, the US government is now talking about you know, this, this you know, anti-inflation bill that Biden has introduced. Act that Biden has introduced gives something like three hundred and fifty billion dollars of industrial subsidies to companies that come to the US and develop green technologies there. And already you have complaints from people like Robert Habeck, the German vice-chancellor, from Emmanuel Macron and other officials in France, from all sorts of people who are saying that European industry is being tempted by all of these packages to migrate en masse to the United States. And other parts of it will go en masse to China and other places like that, where they will soon be getting pipeline gas. Well, they're already getting some pipeline gas at lower prices from the Russians. But LNG prices are going to rise globally because in this fragmented energy market that we now have, everybody will be in competition with everybody else. I mean, was that the goal from from the get-go? Is it about demolishing... um, European industry, what we've been talking about for a while now, the deindustrialization, but has it always been about not only are we going to 
deindustrialize Europe, but we're going to make sure that uh, that the U.S. is in an advantageous position, not only not only with regards to Europe either, because it seems like if you can deindustrialize Europe and then get Europe to drive the price of LNG higher, while the U.S. remains to a certain extent self-sufficient in LNG in, in gas and can uh, can compete at lower prices it makes the US more competitive not only against Europe but in the world as well i mean is that yeah. kind of yeah the thinking was that kind of what uh what they were going after when they got the EU to uh to go for this well if you if you remember that live stream we did with Garland Nix and he says that his some people in the United States were, in fact, thinking in precisely those terms. And, you know, I, I, it's logical that they would be. The big question is not whether the Americans planned it in advance. Perhaps they did. The big question is why were the Europeans so stupid <laughs> as to go along with this? Because if you remember, when all this started, way back in March, we were talking here on the Duran about how all of these uh, sanctions... We, we spoke about this the moment Nord Stream 2 was cancelled. We said that what is being set in place is the deindustrialization of Europe. What we were talking about then, everybody is talking about now, including top officials, people like Habeck and Macron in Europe. But they seem to have no idea what to do about it. They don't have any plan. There's some talk now about setting up a rival subsidy scheme to Biden's. In other words, spend more money to subsidise European businesses <laughs> to try and keep up with the Americans, who have always got deeper pockets, remember. I mean, uh, uh, this at a time when, you know, central banks are trying to raise interest rates to suck up excess liquidity and... Uh, um, governments are supposed to be engaging in fiscal consolidations. But anyway, there's talk now about setting up a rival subsidy scheme to the Americans. I mean, whether that's ever going to happen, I have absolutely no idea. But overall, they've screwed themselves. They've screwed European industry. And just consider what could happen over the next few months. We've just had another massive missile strike by the Russians on Ukraine. Um, for most of yesterday, Ukraine, most of Ukraine was without electricity. The Russians are now starting to go after Ukraine's gas network. The mayor of Kiev is now definitely, it seems to me, moving towards telling people to leave Kiev. We're getting this now increasingly from more and more Ukraine. U Ukrainian officials, that people are being advised to leave the cities. And we've discussed how that's going to provoke a massive refugee flow towards Europe. So just imagine one possible but very likely scenario over the next few months. In the spring, summer, perhaps even earlier in the winter, we're going to start to get rises in gas prices in Europe. The gas prices in Europe are going to start rising again because the reserves are going to run down. Uh, there's no pipeline gas coming in from Russia to replace the gas that was there. We're going to have problems with diesel because the EU imported most of its diesel from Russia, as it turns out, and that isn't going to, that's probably going to stop as well. We're going to have all the complications created by the oil price gap which over time is probably going to create shortages and raise prices. So all of that's coming. There's a severe recession now um, shaping up across Europe. Perhaps come the autumn of 2023, we will have an energy price crunch in Europe. Not just an energy price crunch, an energy supply crunch too. Real blackouts problems with the French nuclear power industry. And all of this with 2 million, 3 million, 8 million, 10 million Ukrainian refugees all hitting us simultaneously. I mean, if that is not a perfect storm, tell me what is. Yeah, I have to say that the, uh, 
this um, alliance between uh, Van der Leyen, Habeck, Barbach, it's it is an alliance that's that's rooted in in, in the green uh, agenda. So this, this is a very toxic alliance that we've that has formed in in the European Union. And I think that's a lot of the ideology when we talk about the ideology that is driving this. I think that is that that explains the ideology part. In that, you know, these people, these three people in, in specific, they want to see their green dream come to uh, come to, to fruition at any cost. It doesn't matter if in 10, 10, 20 years people have to suffer. They don't care. They have a certain vision for the world in 10, 20 years. And, and that's what they want to uh, to come true. And if it means that they have to destroy all of the industry in uh, in Europe, then so be it. Let's do it now. Let's destroy it all. And, you know, we'll figure out a way to uh, to get through the next 10 or 20 years. That's kind of how they um, how they see things. But from the Russian side, I was listening to um, Nebenzia's speech at the U.N. yesterday. I, I was reading what he said, and, and he said that the reason Russia is taking out one of the reasons they're taking out the electric grid in Ukraine is because. They are in a proxy war with NATO, and they need to stop the uh, transfer of weapons from Europe to uh, to the front lines in the east. And I just was thinking to myself, for for all of this to stop, this NATO funding, this NATO uh, proxy war against Russia, all these weapons pouring in, for all of it to stop, um, it, it, it's not so much about... Ukraine. It's about Europe, isn't it? And so for the Russians, I, I understand a lot of the analysis, and we've said this as well. I mean, you know, we've, we've been on record saying that Russia does not want to see Europe destroyed. Russia wants to see a prosperous Europe because a prosperous Europe means a prosperous Russia, all these things that we've said in the past. But to me, it seems like the only way you're going to get this uh, Maybe, I don't want to say the only, maybe one of the ways that Russia gets this conflict to end is to to disable Europe first mm. before you even, yes. before even considering, I mean, Ukraine to me just seems like it's, it's not as important as, as disabling Europe, it seems. And I agree with that's, that's, that's what you might actually get. Yeah, I agree with that. And I'm going to say something else, you see. I think it was absolutely the case even a year ago, that the Russians did not want to see Europe implode. Uh, and the reason was because they said if this Europe implode, it's their biggest trading partner, that is going to affect the operation of our economy. I think this year that calculus has changed. I think the Russians have discovered something, which is, first of all, that they can survive economically without Europe. I mean, that is one of the things the sanctions have taught them. Um, um, I was reading the comments made by the Deputy Prime Minister of Russia, a man called Belusov, who um, was saying, look, even if there's a global depression, with our foreign trade reduced to minimal levels with Europe and with other places, the effect on us now is going to be minimal. It's going to be far less than it once would have been, because we've been shut out of these Western trading systems. We don't, it almost went on to say, we don't trust the Europeans anymore. We don't see them as a partner, an economic partner anymore. So we've managed to forge links with countries like China, with countries like India, probably more depression resistance, certainly than the Europeans are. And from our point of view, we're simply no longer in a position where we basically care anymore about Europe's economic health, because far from being an economic partner, Europe has made itself not just a geopolitical adversary, but a geopolitical threat to ourselves. So I think the Russian calculus has changed. And from wanting a good relationship with a strong Europe, what they now want is to weaken Europe. 
<laughs> and um, where previously they'd said, for example, that they wanted the European Union to survive, I think that no longer they no, they no longer do. I don't think they have any time or interest in the European Union anymore. So I, 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 I think that Russian calculus has changed completely. And I think that with every week that passes, with every month that passes, with the Russian economy now in strong recovery, um, Russian car production, which is back, always, the, always the part of Russian industry, which it seemed to me was the most exposed to sanctions because it he relied so heavily on imported components from Europe. With Russian motor vehicle production, passenger car production, now having revived, with even the old Peugeot factory in Moscow, which Peugeot sold to the city council in Moscow for, you know, tuppence uh, back in March, now back in production, building what is quite obviously a Chinese car, by the way. Um, um, they don't need that relationship with Europe anymore. I think the Russians themselves are surprised at the extent to which they've discovered that they don't need this relationship any longer. And yes, they're going to achieve their objectives in Ukraine. And if that means grinding Europe, Europe down economically, well, so be it. Yes, yeah, so Russia is is done with Europe, and they're going to grind Europe uh, down, the European Union down. The U.S. is going to grind the European Union down, and Ursula Habeck, Brabak, their green ideology is going to grind the European yeah. Union down. Absolutely, and this the is, big question. This is it. The, this is it, and the big question, and this is where you know we come up with all the various theories that swirl around this, is how did it happen? How did it happen that this green ideology in Europe, which never, be, be absolutely clear about this, I mean, it's far from the case that most Europeans have, you know, bought into it fully. I was looking at figures for electric car sales in Britain, for example, and Britain is a country very much, you know, like Germany at the very far end of all of this. And electric cars, the number of electric cars in, in, in Britain has basically flatlined for some time now. It, 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 it peaked at about 15%. And if anything, it's fallen back slightly. So most Europeans, I think, yeah, I mean, you know, they don't argue with the climate change thing because everybody talks about it. It's spoken about as if it's, you know, the absolute truth. But, you know, they live their lives. Um, so how is it then that this green ideology gained so much of a hold on European policy? The election in Germany. Now, well, the elections in Germany, but I mean, that already is a build up. I mean, the, the, you know, it isn't. I mean, even with the election in Germany, I mean, the Greens got, what was it, 15% of the vote? I mean, how is it that can, the European Commission was taken over with all of this? Well, can you I make mean, the there, argument lots that, of okay, questions. so you have, no, I mean, we reported on no. this, so you have Ursula, okay, Angela Merkel, she puts Ursula in, in position, and then we, we reported on the elections in, in Germany, and I mean, can you not make the argument that you had this this situation where you had a very Angela Merkel? She hollowed out the political yeah. uh, competition yeah. around her yeah. on purpose. Yes. Uh, so we ended up with a very weak Chancellor and Schultz, yeah. and these these two Green Party uh, officials who are very aggressive. Yes, and they saw the opening. They saw a weak Schultz. They saw yes. the opening and. And they took over. And, and well, now you have this alliance between between those three uh, individuals. Yes, yes. But it was the, the point is, Ursula herself is not from the, a green background. But it seems to me that the EU, the commission, the central institutions of the EU have been using the Greens as a kind of shock troops because from their point of view, promoting green policies has been extraordinarily advantageous 
in strengthening the position, the, e the position of the EU central institutions. In other words, they, it has given them uh, um, enormous power to interfere in energy policies, in industrial subsidies, in everything that you can possibly think about. And of course, they've formed this alliance with each other in pushing back against Russia. So it, it, it's been a toxic mix. And until and unless this alliance is broken in some form, um, it seems to me we're just going to go on hurtling in this direction until eventually some big crisis comes. Possibly, you know, this year, possibly, well, early next year, possibly in the summer, but sooner or later it will come. Yeah, I mean, just to to finish out the video, I've, I've come to the, the understanding that Europe is going to eke out this winter. I mean, they're going to eke it. They're going to get through this winter. It's going to be hard, but they'll get through. Next year is going to be a disaster. Yes. And, and they're going to make it through this winter because, as you, as you noted earlier in the video, uh, they were able to, to stockpile on all the Russian gas way in the beginning yes. of the year. Yes. Next winter, yes. that's gone. That's gone. Yes, as I said, I think his name is John uh, uh, Gentolini, who is the EU industry commission he's essentially admitted this <laughs> he said 2023 is going to be the real difficult year uh, the qatari government has said so which is of course a major lng producer they by the way are seen to be reducing their supplies of lng to europe <laughs> which is quite interesting but i mean one gets the sense that there's no planning for this no real expectations about what to do. And by the way, the only thing I can see at the moment, and there's been a flood of articles today, uh, over the course of today in the British media, all of them talking about the optimal outcome, the way to solve all of these problems, which is the fall of Putin in Russia. I mean, I read articles... An Good article in that. The Guardian by Timothy Garden Ash, an article in The Daily Telegraph by Con Coughlin. There's been a long piece in The Economist about uh, 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 this uh, very topic. And I think there's been some others as well. So we come back to, to what I said earlier, um, either Putin falls or the European Union falls. Yes. Yes. I mean, is, is yes. that where we are? Well, that seems to be the only thing that they have because they don't seem to be able to change course. It's this desperate hope that this is all going to somehow work out because there's going to be a political crisis in Moscow and the government there will fall and some new oligarch-backed regime in Moscow will, you know, open the taps again, open the gas and oil fields to our exploitation and put everything right. Now, there's no sign of this happening. I mean, the political position, I mean, Putin has come under some criticism, especially since the Herson withdrawal again. But I mean, overall, his ratings look pretty solid at around 80 percent. There's no sign, as far as I can see, of any political crisis. The economy is strengthening. I mean, it doesn't seem as if regime change is likely. And if Putin were to fall, why all these people assume that whoever took over would be more accommodating, I really can't see. The mood in Moscow, and I spoke to somebody, uh, a friend of mine, who is, you know, uh, you know, he's in the business community, very much perhaps in some ways on the liberal end of establishment politics in Russia. But, I mean, he was breathing fire. He didn't, doesn't want to see compromise. Um, I'm not saying, you know, he's representative of Russian opinion, but every survey I have seen is that most Russians, overwhelmingly most Russians, want their government to take an even harder line on Ukraine and on the EU than Putin does, and that all the criticism he's getting is from there. But that is now the hope that there's going to be some kind of political crisis in Moscow and that's going to somehow magically solve the whole problem. Yeah, that's the paradox of it all, isn't it? Is that if you were to achieve, if you really wanted a regime change in Moscow, the best way to achieve a regime change is to get Putin to agree to a peace deal right yeah. now. Yeah. I mean, to actually get a peace deal without yeah. Russia 
going all the way to to Odessa or whatever without Russia doing all of this. That is how you will get a lot of Russian society pissed off at Putin as if exactly. you actually say, OK, Putin, um, let's let's come to the table and let's shake hands. Yes. Peace. Yes. I mean, then Russian society is going, going to be like, well, you know, what was this all for? Exactly. And, and you're, that's how you're, you're so discontent with Putin. That's the paradox you, of it all. You are, you are absolutely right. And going back to that very conversation that I was talking about with this person I know, I mean, that was his fear. <laughs> not, 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 not because he likes Putin. As a matter of fact, he doesn't. I mean, as I said, he's, if anything, tilts somewhat to the liberal thing, side. But, you know, he, he is... He's never liked Putin, and he thinks that Putin will eventually do some kind of cynical deal uh, at, at, at Russia's expense, betraying what Russia ought to be doing in Ukraine. And, uh, uh, um, you know, people conjure up what happened with Milosevic when he did deals in Bosnia, and he, deal, he, he as they say, betrayed the Serbs in Croatia and that sort of thing. And you get lots of people in Russia. That is the major... That is the major worry in Russia. And every time there's a withdrawal, like the one in Kherson, that's what people say. You see, this is preparing the ground for this cynical deal that uh, Putin and the people around him want to, want to arrange. So that's, that's, the, that's the major fear that there is in Russia amongst most people. You're absolutely right. If a deal like that were done, that might actually trigger a crisis. <laughs> uh, but of course, a peace deal ref- would trigger a, a crisis. Peace deal. Yeah. Exactly. But refusing, refusing to negotiate, which is what they're doing instead. That was, you know, Timothy Garden Ash, Con Coughlin, all of these people. They talk about must be no negotiations. We must increase arms supplies. You know, <laughs> even though the arms are getting depleted, we must do all of these things. And uh, because uh, um, that's the only way to achieve peace. They never provide any explanation of how they expect that to achieve peace but always the hope is as i said that some kind of ukrainian victory <laughs> is going to somehow lead to the fall of the putin government and replacing it with something more accommodating to the political system you know to, 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 to the west I mean, it's fantasy. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a dangerous illusion, but that's all they have. I got one more comment before we finish the video, which uh, for, for you to comment on. Uh, in the past, when the EU was under the control of Merkel, which it was under the control of Merkel, they were always good at kicking the can down the road. So, so I mean, what's going on in the EU right now, not having a plan, doesn't surprise me because the EU was never good at, at, at planning stuff. But they always had Merkel there and she could always just kick the can down the road. And eventually she would patch together some sort of solution and it and it worked. You you know, okay, people can argue and say, well, it didn't work well, but it doesn't matter. Merkel always figured out a way to get through things. I think one of the big problems is that they don't have someone. I mean, Ursula is not a Merkel. Schultz is not a Merkel. I mean, they're kicking the can down the road again with the gas and the oil and everything. Yeah. But they don't have someone like Merkel who can figure out a way and navigate things so that she can, you know, somehow keep the EU running. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Because, of course, the one thing Merkel always understood is that the only way the EU could survive was if it avoided a major crisis. I mean, it, 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 her entire policy was to keep crises whenever they arose under some kind of control. So she patch things up in one way or another. It was never very satisfactory. It left all the underlying problems unresolved, but it got her th- it got the EU through to the next problem, if you like. This lot don't see that. They don't understand that. On the contrary, they have actually sought out crises. <laughs> they, they sought out a crisis with Russia, which is something that Merkel always understood I don't think she ever liked Putin very much. In fact, it's widely known that the two, you know, when they weren't 
together. I mean, together they'd always be the best of friends. He'd give her flowers. She'd send him beer, all that kind of thing. But in practice, they did. It's fairly well known that they didn't like each other. They didn't trust each other. But she, they, she always understood that at the end of the day, she had to keep the show with the Russians on the road, and the EU, the present lot, don't see that. They don't really understand that they have all kinds of problems. She's not the moderating influence. And you can see this. So relations between Germany and France, by the way, are now apparently at rock bottom. Schultz and Macron can't stand each other. There's all kinds of issues between them. Relations between France and Italy, two you know, friendly countries, they're at rock bottom over immigration. The French interior minister has just spoken of the new Italian government as an enemy of France. You have all of these things starting to you know, fall apart. They're all arguing, they're all quarrelling in ways that publicly, in the ways that Merkel would never have allowed... And, of course, the crises are building up rapidly around them. And they not only have no plan, but they have no, they have no person like Merkel to stabilise, to, to, you know, to steady the ship and to somehow guide it through the storm. Yeah. All right. Uh, we will end the video there, the Durant.locals.com, and go to the Durant shop, 10% off. Use the code GOODDAY. You can also find us on Rockfin as well. Okay. Well, we both got Take our care. Greek mugs. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Take care.